Be thou my vision. Thank you for watching The Word and Sword presented by the Newton Church of Christ in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to call in during this program to ask your Bible questions. Call 828-465-3009. This episode of The Word and Sword includes our ongoing study of the sacrifice of the Son with a focus on the Lord's trial before the Roman governor, Pilate. Next, we discuss the one thing that matters above all other issues of life. Our third lesson answers the fundamental question of, what is faith? We conclude the program with a continuation of our study in 1 Peter as we examine his teaching on the husband-wife relationship. Again, we thank you for watching the Word and Sword program. We encourage you to call 828 828- 465-3009 and ask your Bible questions. You can also visit our website at wordandsword.com. We continue in our series of studies on the sacrifice of the Son, and we're looking at the arrest and trials of Jesus Christ. We begin, though, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, to note what Paul wrote in reference to Christ being crucified here. In 1 Corinthians 1, verse 12, Now this I say, I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Now, The problem at Corinth was they were dividing, they were denominating among themselves, and they were dividing up after these men, well, I'm a Cephasite, or, you know, Peter, I'm a Paulite, I'm an Apostolite, Apollos, a follower of Apollos. And he says here, first of all, was Paul crucified for you? And the answer to that is no. Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Well, no. So if Paul wasn't crucified for you and you weren't baptized in the name of Paul, then why would you call yourself after Paul? And the same would apply for Apollos or for Cephas. But turn that around. What's he really saying here? Who was crucified for you? Christ. In whose name are you baptized? Christ. So to be of Christ, Christ. Christ had to be crucified for you, which he was, and you have to be baptized in the name of Christ. That's how you can say you are of Christ. Now, let's understand that Christ has been crucified for us, and so we owe him our allegiance, and that allegiance, that oath if you will, to be dedicated to him is finalized when we are immersed, buried with him in baptism, and then we rise up to walk in newness of life. Colossians chapter 2 refers to baptism as a circumcision of Christ. So we think of it this way, that's the sign or the seal of the covenant between us and God, that we believe, we repent of our sins, We confess our belief before men, and we're baptized. And then we are of Christ, showing that we are thankful that He has given His life for us, and that in Him we have the redemption of our souls, the remission of sins. And so as we think about the study of the sacrifice of the Son, let the Lord's devotion to you motivate you to be devoted to him. Now, our study left off on his trial before the Jews. That was early on Friday morning. Remember, Thursday night, he observed the Passover with his disciples. He talked to them through that night. He went out to the Garden of Gethsemane, where he offered up the prayer to the Father. And then after the third time praying that, Judas and the mob showed up to arrest him, and then he went before the high priest Annas, and then before Caiaphas, and he went before the council, and he was formally charged with blasphemy, found guilty, 
And so they believe him to be deserving of death. And we now pick up when he goes on trial before the Romans. And there are a lot of accusations that are brought against him. But eventually what he's convicted on is being king of the Jews. So let's begin now in Matthew chapter 27. And let's read, first of all, verses 1 and 2. Matthew chapter 27, verses 1 and 2. It says, When morning came, all the chief priests and elders of the people plotted against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Now, it talks about Pontius Pilate, the governor. Pontius Pilate, or Pilate, as we know him most often, served from around 26 to 36 AD. Um, Stephen Dandau Collins' book, Caesar's Legion, talks about Pilate, how he was a prefect. Uh, he had this rule over Judea and Samaria for about 10 years, again, from 26 to 36 AD. And also in Dandau Collins' book, Mark Anthony's Heroes, it makes mention that Pilate offended the Jews. He had a problem with the Jews. There was this tension, this conflict between Pilate and the Jews. He didn't respect them, didn't respect their religion, didn't like the idea that he had to cater to the Jews and their, what Pilate would have seen as peculiar ways. So he offended them on more than one occasion. At the beginning of his rule, he had a run-in with the Jews and he offended them by displaying the legion standards because they, they weren't supposed to display the legion standards because the Jews looked at those as idolatrous because very often they were dedicated to a particular God. And so they would have to cover their standards when they went in Jerusalem. But in the beginning of Pilate's rule, he just sort of boldly displayed them because he was going to prove his point that he was the one in authority and he wasn't going to play along with the Jews. Well, it offended the Jews very much so. The Jews rioted, and it became so bad that Pilate had to back off. But then later, he offended the Jews again. And this time, he dug his heels in and refused to back down. So the Jews appealed to Tiberius Caesar, the same Caesar that is on the throne when Jesus is on trial here in what we're studying. So previous occasion, Pilate angered the Jews. He wouldn't back down. They went to Tiberius, complained to him. Tiberius sent word to Pilate, you have to give in. You have to change. And so Pilate ended up making the changes. And all that's just to say that when Jesus goes on trial, that there's an adversarial relationship already between Pilate and the Jewish leaders and the Jewish people. And there's this dynamic here that they've had these run-ins before, and the Jews have gone around him and over his head to Caesar to get their way. So keep that in mind as we go down through this account here. So let's go to John 19 and Luke 23 and notice both these passages. These are, again, parallel, as the gospel accounts give parallel accounts of what happened in the life of Jesus, some giving some information, others giving other. But we're trying to blend them together as we go through the sacrifice of the Son here. And let's notice, first of all, in Luke chapter 23, verse 2, or rather, let's go to John. I take that back. Let's go to John 18, because we want to try to take it in order here. John chapter 18, verses 29 down through 32. It says, Pilate then went out to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, if he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. Then Pilate said to them, You take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. So these men are very clear with Pilate, We want you to put him to death. And that's sort of ironic how that they are doing that and they're 
murdering an innocent man, and they know he's innocent. He hasn't really committed any kind of crime whatsoever, but they want to put him to death, but they wouldn't go into the praetorium because they were afraid of being defiled, so ceremonially defiled. But be that as it may, the first thing they do is when they bring him to Pilate, and Pilate asks, what accusation do you bring against him? They say, if he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. In other words, he's bad, take our word for it. Initially, they just try to bamboozle Pilate, if you will. But then back in Luke 23, notice what it says there. And when they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ a king. So it seems initially they said, well, he's an evildoer. You just need to take him and put him to death. But then when Pilate pushed back a little bit, they brought these accusations out against him. He was perverting the nation, what they said. Well, that was a lie. He wasn't perverting the the Jewish nation at all. They said he's forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar when they know good and well when they challenged him on paying taxes. He said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, unto God the things that are God's. And he himself paid taxes. So we recognize that they are completely lying and deceiving before Pilate here trying to get Jesus to be put to death. And they said that he himself is Christ a king. Now, he had claimed to be king, but not in the way that they're presenting it to Pilate, as we'll talk about and look at in just a moment. So they bring him before Pilate. Pilate, take him away, put him to death. He's a bad guy. Pilate doesn't buy it. Okay, here's the things that we have an issue with. Here's things that prove he's a bad guy. Well, then notice what Pilate does when, when they told him he himself is Christ a king. Pilate then asked the question, are you the king of the Jews? In Luke 23, verse 3, he asked that. In John 18, we have the extended account about what goes on between Pilate and Jesus in this interview, this trial. So John 18, verse 33, beginning. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself about this? Or did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight, so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Therefore, Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You rightly say that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? Now, we'll pause there for just a second. He asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Now, Jesus responds to this with, Did you perceive this of yourself? In other words, have you received reports or have you observed that I am some type of threat, that I'm causing instability to Roman rule? Am I an evildoer in society? Is is that what you're seeing? Am I raising up a political movement against you? And of course, the answer was no. And Jesus knew that. And he asked Pilate, or did others tell you about this? Is this just envy? Is this just the Jewish leaders with an ax to grind and causing trouble? And Pilate knew very well that it was because of envy. So Pilate then comes back and says to him, your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? See, it would not be normal for the Jews to deliver up one of their own to the Romans to be put on trial and put to death because they had this adversarial relationship. They wouldn't do that. And so Pilate's saying, you must be really, really bad for them to deliver you to me. So just go ahead and tell me what it is that you've done 
that has made them so angry? Well, Jesus then responds this way. My kingdom is not of this world. First of all, my kingdom is no threat to you. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight. Now, his servants, you could see that as, you know, Peter, James, John, Matthew, others who would fight for him, others in Galilee that may rise up and fight for him. But if you think back to the arrest in the garden and the Lord telling Peter, do you not know I could call 12 legions of angels? Well, that's his servants, really. If I wanted to fight, I would fight. If I wanted to have a war, I could have a war. But that's not why I'm here. My kingdom's not of this world. The Lord did not come with any intention of establishing an earthly kingdom. He never intends to establish an earthly kingdom. He says, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. So the Lord's signaling to Pilate, you are not my enemy It's the Jews. I don't have an adversarial relationship with Rome. I have it with the Jews. And he's talking about the Jewish leaders there. So he's saying, I'm no threat to Rome. I'm no political rival. I'm no military rival. I'm not trying to undermine Rome's rule or anything like that. He's not a king challenging Caesar and Caesar's right to rule there because his kingdom is not this world. So Pilate understands that. And in verse 37, that's why he comes back and says, well, are you a king then? And Jesus answers in the affirmative. Yes, it's the reason I was born for this cause I have come. And he says he came to bear witness of the truth. He's the king of truth. And all who love the truth follow him. He's the king of those who love truth, followers of truth. And then Pilate asked that question. And we don't know whether it was sarcasm or he was serious. What is truth? But then it says this in John 18, 38. And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. Now keep your place there and let's go to Luke 23. Luke 23, let's pick up again what's being said here. Pilate asks in verse 3, are you the king of the Jews? He answered and said, it is as you say, 23 verse 4. So Pilate said to the chief priests in the crowd, I find no fault in this man. But they were the more fierce, saying he stirs up people teaching throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee to this place. So Pilate comes out after interviewing Jesus and says, I find no fault in him. That's not guilty, number one. He's not guilty. Pilate knew it, and he declares that to the people. But then he goes on trial before Herod. And let's notice this in Luke 23, verses 6 through 12. It says, When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked if the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent Herod, sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. Now when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad. For he had desired for a long time to see him because he had heard many things about him, and he hoped to see some miracle done by him. Then he questioned him with many words, but he answered him nothing. And the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. Then Herod, with his men of war, treated him with contempt and mocked him, arrayed him in a gorgeous robe, and sent him back to Pilate. That very day, Pilate and Herod became friends with each other, for previously they had been at enmity with each other. Now, this Herod that's spoken of here is Herod Antipas, and he had authority over Galilee. So that's why Pilate sends him over. Herod was there for the feast, like many Jews were there for the feast, for the Passover, for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So he's there And he hears of Galilee, Jesus being from there. And Pilate's thinking, I'll let him deal with this problem. So he pushes it over to Herod, who was under Pilate, as far as the Roman system rule went. But 
this Herod Antipas here was son of Herod the Great. Herod the Great is the one who tried to kill Jesus when he was an infant in Matthew chapter 2. And this Herod Antipas here is the one who beheaded John when John rebuked him for living in adultery. He told him, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And he ended up being beheaded over that issue. It says here that he wanted to see Jesus. He wanted to see some miracle done by him. And you get the sense in this context. He just sees Jesus as a source of wonder or amazement or entertainment. And it's sad, but there's a lot of people that in our modern times have turned the religion of Christ and the worship of Christ into a festival, into an entertainment event, into a carnival, to a concert very often. It's just entertainment for them. Who can get the most excitement going? Who can get everybody ecstatic and jumping around and things like that? That seems to be the attitude Herod had. Let me see something neat. Let me see something cool. Almost like he wanted to see a magic show. But while he's there before Herod, says Jesus doesn't answer anything. He will not speak to Herod because Herod was a wicked, immoral, vile individual and did not deserve an answer. And there are people like that, as Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount, don't cast what is holy to the dogs. Don't cast your pearls before the swine. So he wasn't casting any pearls here. Well, the Jews then vigorously attack Jesus, accusing him of many things. But Herod even sees through this, like, there's really nothing here. And he and his men of war mock Jesus and send him back over to Pilate. And in a moment, we'll come back and look at that second trial before Pilate. This Bible study program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ, located in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to call 828-465-3009 to talk to one of our members and ask your Bible question. Some of the questions we receive will be used on a future episode of the program to help others who may have the same question. Again, that number is 828-465-3009. We pick up now in Luke 23 where Herod sends Jesus back to Pilate, and he's on trial the second time before Pilate. So Luke 23, verse 13, beginning, and we're going to read a longer section here down through verse 25. Then Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, said to them, You have brought this man to me as one who misleads the people, and indeed, having examined him in your presence, I have found no fault in this man concerning those things of which you accuse him. No, neither did Herod, for I sent you back to him, and indeed nothing deserving of death has been done by him. I will therefore chastise him and release him. For it was necessary for him to release one to them at the feast. And they all cried out at once, saying, Away with this man and release to us Barabbas, who had been thrown into prison for a certain rebellion made in the city, and for murder. Pilate, therefore, wishing to release Jesus, again called out to them. But they shouted, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Then he said to them the third time, Why, what evil has he done? I have found no reason for death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. But they were insistent, demanding with loud voices that he be crucified. And the voices of these men and of the chief priest prevailed. So Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they requested. And he released to them the one they requested, who for rebellion and murder had been thrown into prison. But he delivered Jesus to their will. Now let's look at this a little bit closer. When he comes back to Pilate, Pilate confronts the Jewish leaders again and tells them again, I have found no fault in him, not guilty number two. Herod found no fault in him, right? So he's declared him not guilty 
at the beginning. He's declared him not guilty again here. And he says, well, then I'll chastise him and, and release him. You're, you're angry with him. OK, I'll rough him up a bit, but I'm going to let him go. And they go berserk. No, crucify him. You need to crucify him. And they called for Barabbas, who for rebellion and murder, they're accusing Jesus of being a rebel before Pilate. And that's eventually, essentially what they convict him on or get him convicted on. But they're asking for one who is guilty of rebellion and is guilty of murder. It's very ironic how twisted these religious men's minds have become and how they rationalize and justified fighting against God here. It's sad, but those types of things still go on today. Men who are religious rationalize their way into sin. But be that as it may, it says here, verse 22, he said to them the third time, what evil has he done? I found no reason for death in him. Not guilty, number three. Not guilty. Pilate continues to try to tell the people, and he continues to see very clearly, Jesus is not guilty. He's not deserving of death. He should be let go. Now, he says, I'll chastise him and let him go. Now, it's at this point. Let's go to Matthew 27. At this point, after they have called for crucifixion of Jesus, the release of Barabbas, in Matthew chapter 27, notice verse 23, or rather, let's back up just to catch the context here. In verse 21, the governor answered and said to them, which of the two do you want me to release to you? They said Barabbas. So it's, it's right in what we we're just reading in Luke. And you jump down to verse 24. It says, when Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and on our children. That's not guilty number four, when Pilate washed his hands. And what I hope you see as we're going through this and looking at these parallel accounts and, and striving to go through in a chronological order, that... Pilate continually comes back. It's not as though Pilate said not guilty just one time and then he later caved. He goes back to them again and again. He's not guilty. He's not guilty. So this is when he has Jesus scourged in Matthew 27, verse 26. Then he released Barabbas to them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Let's go to keep your place in Matthew 27, but also open up to John chapter 19, we'll notice in just a moment. So it says that he was scourged, and probably you've studied this before, but the scourging took place with a whip, and at the end of the whip were leather strands, and at the end of those and woven into those was rock and metal and bone, sharp things that when the whip hit the back of the individual who had been wrapped around a post or, or strapped over a rock or something to stretch it out, their back was stripped, that when it hit their back, it would cut into their back. And the scourging was a torturous thing to go through. Um, Tacitus a historian says that seven out of 10 people died from the scourging alone because you think about all the blood loss and there is a, accounts of where people's organs were exposed because they had been lashed with a whip in scourging so many times. So it was nothing short of torture, what they're doing to Jesus here in scourging him. And so they, they scourged the Lord and then in Matthew 27, 27, then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. When they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him and put his own clothes on him and led him away to be crucified. Just imagine what that was like, how he's scourged, he's tortured. 
And then after that, when he's throbbing in pain and suffering and blood is flowing out of his body, they take him in and they dress him up, mocking him like a king, crown of thorns, and they begin to make fun of him and spit upon him. How humiliating, how difficult that would have been for the Lord to go through. Well, you come back to John 19 now, John chapter 19, and notice verse 4. It says, Pilate went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. That's not guilty, number five. Pilate again after he scourged and when he is suffering, tries to go out and reason with them. In John 19, verse 5, then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, behold the man. Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out saying, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, you take him and crucify him for I find no fault in him, not guilty number six, that these men were so filled with bloodlust that even when Jesus is standing there before them with blood coming out of his head, blood flowing off of his back, that they're not satisfied with that and cry out for him to be crucified. Well, let's go in John 19 verses 7 through 11 now. Notice Pilate has some fear that comes up in him. It says, the Jews answered him, we have a law and according to our law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was the more afraid and went again into the praetorium and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? Jesus answered, You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. Now, when he tells the Jews, I find no fault in him, you take him, you crucify him, they come back with, well, according to our law, he deserves to die because he made himself the son of God. That catches Pilate off guard. And it's not that Pilate thinks that Jesus is the divine Son of God as the Bible presents him to us. But Pilate, being a pagan, had an idea that the gods come down and walk among men. And if you go up against them, then you can be in real trouble. So that's really what's in the back of Pilate's mind. But as he goes in to talk to Jesus about this, Jesus won't answer him. And Pilate's marveling at that and says, I have power to crucify you, I have power to release you. And Jesus tells Pilate the reality of the situation. You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. In other words, God is ultimately in control here, not you, Pilate. You think you have all this great power, and you don't. This is not in your hands. So, Understanding that God places men in positions like this, and he will even use evil men to accomplish his purposes. So he's using Pilate here to accomplish his purpose of Jesus being the Lamb of God. But he, um, Jesus makes this statement here, therefore the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. He's not saying Pilate doesn't have sin. What he's saying is the Jews should have known better. And as Jesus has said elsewhere, to whom much is given, much is required. The Jews have been given much by God, and he was expecting much from them. And so that's the idea. They have the greater sin. They should have known better than to reject the Son of David, reject the Son of God. They should have accepted and embraced Jesus, but instead they are calling for his execution. Now, verses 12 to 16, where we have the formal sentencing of Jesus here. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. 
Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Jesus. Then he delivered him to be crucified. They, then they took Jesus and led him away. So what's happening here? Why does, why does Pilate change? Why does he finally give in? Well, the Jews are back blackmailing Pilate here. When they say, if you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. There was a formal designation in Rome called Amicus Kaiser, that is, friend of Caesar. And if someone had that and it was pulled back, that often meant the loss of their position, so Pilate would lose his governorship, confiscation of their property, and exile to a foreign land. So this is a very serious thing that they're saying to Pilate here. It's not saying, well, you're just not a supporter of Caesar, which that would be true, but it goes beyond that. And again, because they have gone around Pilate before and complained to Tiberius Caesar and Tiberius Caesar, who really didn't care for Pilate because some other things that had happened in the past, that he would come against Pilate and essentially ruin Pilate's life, <laughs> maybe even take it if it went that far. But here's the point. They are saying, we'll go to Caesar so you need to do what we're telling you to do. And Pilate knew they were deadly serious here. And so Pilate goes and sits in the judgment seat. And he says, behold your king. And they say, we have no king but Caesar, which was pure, utter hypocrisy. The Jews as a whole hated the Romans, hated Caesar. But because their hatred for the Son of God exceeded that, they're willing to compromise and say, oh, we love Caesar, which absolutely wasn't true. So Pilate then sentences him, says he's to be crucified. They deliver him to be crucified. And we want to close out in Luke 23 with Jesus on the way to the cross. In Luke 23, verse 26 beginning, just notice this short little insertion in Luke here of what's happening as Jesus is going from being on trial out to where they're going to crucify him. Luke 23, 26. Now, as they led him away, they lay hold of a certain Simon, a Cyrenian, who was coming from the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. And a great multitude of the people followed him and women who also mourned and lamented him. But Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For indeed the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren, wombs that never bore, and breasts which never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if they do these things in the green wood, what will be done in the dry? Such a touching picture here. As Jesus is going out, they have to get somebody else to carry his cross. As Jesus was weak, he couldn't carry it and take it out himself. And as he's going out there, these women are weeping. They see him. Again, remember the condition he's in. There's blood coming off of his head where they had the crown of thorns and they hit him when he had the crown of thorns in with a reed. His back has been shredded from the scourging. And he's headed out there and they see this and they, they know what's about to happen. And they're weeping and mourning over the fact that this Jesus of Nazareth, a man they knew to be a good man, was being treated this way and suffering so badly. But Jesus turns to them and says, don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. 
And that seems like an odd thing to say, but Jesus is telling them things are going to get really bad for you. And he's looking forward about 40 years or so to the destruction of Jerusalem. And he says there, there's the days coming when those who have never had children will be called blessed. Because the suffering is going to be so bad, you're going to want to die. That you want the mountains to fall on us, the hills to cover us. And he says this thing that's kind of cryptic to us. For if they do these things in Greenwood, what will be done in the dry? Here's the idea. If Jesus, who is innocent, during a time when there's relative peace between Rome and the Jews, if they will do this to him, what's going to happen to you when in the late 60s AD that the Jews rebel against Rome and there's a war that's taking place and the city is laid siege by the Roman army. And if you go back and look at historical accounts, it was a horrific time. And so he's saying there's great suffering coming to you. Think about that. And I'm concerned about that. He was concerned and compassionate toward them because he could see that suffering that was coming in the future. It's so very interesting and touching how that Jesus, when he's in terrific pain and about to go and experience even more on the cross, that he's expressing concern and compassion for those who are around him. That's a great example, a great picture of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and his love for us. As we think about the sacrifice that he gave for us, let's allow that to motivate us to devote ourselves to him. Christ was crucified for us. And if we want to be of Christ, as we studied at the beginning, let us be baptized in the name of Christ. And we can enjoy the benefits of of the blood that was shed, we can have the remission of our sins and we can look forward to eternal life. So meditate, dwell upon the sacrifice of the Son and let it cause you to turn to Him. This Bible study program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ located in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to call 828 465 3009 to talk to one of our members and ask your Bible question. Some of the questions we receive will be used on a future episode of the program to help others who may have the same question. Again, that number is 828-465-3009. Life can become complicated and difficult and confusing at times. You know, when we're little children, we have a very simple life. We eat, we play, we sleep. We get up, we eat, we play, we eat, we play, and we sleep. It's very simple. Not a lot of cares and burdens and struggles in life. We remain oblivious to so many things. We get older into our teen years, to our young adulthood, and things begin to add up over time. You know, there's pressures of school or you get a part-time job and there's responsibilities there and there's different challenges that begin to appear in life. But then when you enter in fully, if you will, to adulthood, you maybe enter into a career. It's not just a part-time job, but this is how I'm making a living and providing for myself. You, you get married you have responsibilities as a spouse to someone else. You have children. You have responsibilities as a parent. And the difficulties of life begin to add up and the bills begin to pile up. And life can get difficult. It can get complicated, if you will. And during these times in our lives when these troubles come, you know, our priorities can get out of whack. We can have the wrong focus in our life and things begin to creep in and to choke out our focus on serving God. We can get to a point where we drift by through the years, where we think to ourselves, and maybe it's in the back of our mind, 
you know, I need to change some things about my life. And I really should focus more on God and his will and honoring him. But we're caught up with life and that doesn't happen. And one year after another, maybe one decade after another goes by and we get confused on what really matters. But what we want to notice in this lesson is besides heaven, nothing else matters. Let's go to 2 Kings chapter 20. 2 Kings chapter 20. We want to read about an incident in the life of Hezekiah and what happened with him. In 2 Kings 20 verse 1, it says, In those days Hezekiah was sick and near death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amoz, went to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Then he turned his face toward the wall and prayed to the Lord, saying, Remember now, O Lord, I pray, how I have walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart, and have done what was good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. And it happened before Isaiah had gone out into the middle court that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Return and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, Thus says the Lord, the God of David your father, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Surely I will heal you. On the third day you shall go up to the house of the Lord, and I will add to your days fifteen years. So let's think about this for a minute. You know, Hezekiah is told he would die. He's only 39 years old at this point. He died at 54 years of age. So he's 39 here. To some people, that's old if you're really young. But to most of us, 39 is really young. And to die at 54 is still pretty young. But 39 years old, he's told, put your house in order. You're going to die. You don't have long left on this earth. Would that type of message clarify your priorities? If a doctor came to you, maybe you've experienced this. A doctor comes to you and says, you're terminal. You only have a few weeks, a few months, maybe a few days, maybe a few years, but you don't have long to live. Would that clarify your priorities in life? Would you realize, I need to turn to God. I've not made my life right with Him. I need to Believe Jesus is the Christ. Confess that before me. And I need to repent of my sins. I need to be baptized to have my sins washed away, as Acts 2.38 talks about. Would you get more serious about being forgiven of your sins and drawing close to God? Would you want to reconcile with others? Maybe there's a grudge you have. Maybe there's a bad relationship that grieves you, but you've not done anything about that. But if you were near death, Would you take action? Would you just let that bitterness, that anger, that grudge go? Would you go and talk to that person to straighten things out so that both of you are at peace with the relationship? Would you spend more time or maybe start spending time, we should say, in studying the Word of God to really know Him and to know His will, to know how to please Him? Would you turn to God in prayer? Would you spend more time with your family and give them advice, encourage them, and take time to say your goodbyes? Well, what if it was news about someone you loved? Maybe you got news that your spouse or your child or a parent or a sibling was in a terrible car accident and their life is hanging in the balance. They're in the intensive care unit. They don't know if they're going to make it 24 or 48 hours. What would be important then? Would it be important to do the laundry or to mow the lawn? Maybe your favorite sports team is playing later that evening and it's a championship game. Would you care about watching that? If somebody you love was in a car accident in the hospital and barely hanging on to their life, would work itself even matter? You know, there have been times like that in my life where I've gotten that kind of news and there's nothing else that matters other than focusing on that loved one who's suffering at that time. So, you know, what does Hezekiah do when he gets that news that he himself is going to die? It says in 2 Kings 20 that he turns 
to the Lord. He turned his face to the wall and he prayed to God. God at this point was his only recourse. You think about that, that he couldn't turn to physicians. He couldn't turn to a dietitian. You know, how can I change my diet to be more healthy and all those kinds of things? The only thing that he could do was turn to God. Now, that was his only recourse, but let's also understand that was his best recourse. You know, today, our best recourse is God. He's the Almighty. He's, he's the one who created us and sustains our lives. So he is our best recourse. Now, men can do things for us. Physicians can help us. Others can, can benefit us in life. But let's understand that God is the number one best recourse when we're facing difficulties and trials in our life. Tragedies will help to clarify that for us. Tragedies will help us get our priorities straight. And here's what I want to say. Why wait for the tragedy? Why wait for that difficulty, that pain and sorrow to hit you? Why not get your priorities straight now before those difficult times come? Now, the text goes on to tell us that I... Isaiah said to Hezekiah, the Lord's going to extend your life by 15 more years. Well, that's better than a few days or a few weeks, but it's still a limited amount of time. And what if you were given a limited amount of time, maybe given five years to live? What would you do? Well, you would probably still go about your daily life as normal. You would probably go to work, Uh, tend to daily needs of the house and meals and laundry and different things like that. But you would attend events with family, spend time with family. But there'd be some things that weren't so important. The things that you had planned, maybe pursuing a career, climbing that career ladder, that's not quite as important. If I've only got five years left with my family here on this earth, I'm going to spend more time with them instead of neglecting them. And He would probably strive to draw closer to God instead of finding excuses not to worship God, not to attend church. He would probably find every way in the world to go to church. Maybe if you just have a few months, would you be wasting time going to worship God? The answer to that is no. And the the reality is, even if we live to be 99 Any time that we spend in worshiping God is not wasted time because here's a fact. We all have limited time. James says in James chapter 4 that life is a vapor. So even if we lived into our 90s or 100 or beyond, life is still a vapor. So we have limited time. Let's acknowledge that. Let's live that way and redeem the time, as Paul says so that we are ready to leave this life and to go on to face God in the judgment. Now, in a moment, we're going to come back and notice what Jesus says about what really matters in life. The members of the Newton Church of Christ thank you for watching this Bible study program. Our aim is to assist you to gain a better understanding of God's Word and encourage you to submit to the Lord. We invite you to send us an email with your Bible question or a comment about this episode. Please include your first name and the city or town where you live. We will respond with the Bible answer. You can send your email to contact at wordandsword.com. That's contact at wordandsword.com. As we think about this lesson, nothing else matters when compared with going to heaven. We want to notice what Jesus says about priorities in Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, the Lord in verses 24 to 27 here, talks about really where we should be focused. In Matthew chapter uh, 16, verse 24 beginning, it says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever saves his life, desires to save his life, will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? 
For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. So Jesus tells us what matters here. What profit is there to gain the whole world in losing your soul? And that's a rhetorical question that he asks, because the obvious answer is there's zero profit. If you were to gain the whole world, everything in it, every possession was yours, every territory, every piece of real estate, every ocean, everything was yours. What would it profit you to have all of that and then end up losing your soul? There's no benefit to that. There's no profit in that. So why pursue the things the world has to offer? Why make that your priority? Why allow that to be your driving force in life? The answer is you shouldn't allow that to happen. He says, what will a man give in exchange for a soul? And the reality is anything and everything. You remember the account of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16, where the rich man dies and he wakes up in Hades in torments and he's suffering so bad that he wants Lazarus just to come over and put a drop of water on his tongue. If he could go back and give all of his earthly possessions to escape that torment, he would have done it. But he couldn't, of course. So a man will give anything and everything in order to escape torment and condemnation in the next life in order to save his soul. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? In that sense, it's anything and everything. And in another sense, as you think about what Jesus is saying there, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. What will you give? Well, you have to give yourself. You have to sacrifice yourself. You have to set aside your will, your desires. Take up your cross and follow Christ. It says then, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What's he talking about there? There are things in life that you have to give up. You have to first sacrifice yourself, submit yourself to the will of the Lord. But also let's understand there may be other things in life you have to give up. There may be relationships you have that tend to draw you away from God and into the ways of the world. Those relationships you need to get away from. There are relationships maybe that lead you directly into sin. When you're around these people, it's, it's just you commit sin. And you know it, and then you feel guilty about it later. Well, those things have to be given up. You have to turn away from them. You know, you would give the whole world to avoid losing your soul. But the thing is, you can't get it. You know, even people today in our society that we think of as extremely wealthy, they still don't have the whole world. You can't get it. I can't get it. Nobody can get the whole world. And if you could get the whole world, you could not give it in exchange for your soul because your soul is not redeemed with silver and gold. It's redeemed by the blood of the lamb. So we have to choose what to pursue, whether it's what God offers or what the world offers. The world offers fame and fortune and fun, so to speak. God offers something else from the standpoint of he offers us eternal salvation. Now, when we talk about what the world offers versus what God offers, it doesn't mean that if you follow God, you lead a life of misery, being downtrodden and sad and suffering all the time. No, there are many things to enjoy in this life that are compatible with the will of God. In fact, they're gifts of God. In Psalm 127, let's notice this. Psalm 127 in verse 3 says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward like arrows in the hand of a warrior. So are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. You know, it's so sad that society around us tells us that children are a burden. 
that children are something that are a nuisance in our life. They're, they're an interruption and an interference to pursuing our goals. And our society really teaches a lot of selfishness and says, basically, you know, you need to put your career first, not your children. You follow that career. You, you let your children be raised in daycare. Let other people raise them and take care of them. And you go and pursue your career. Now, sometimes there are people who, because of financial circumstances, because of difficulties, that they have tough choices to make. But we're talking about where people make a conscious decision that essentially their children are too much trouble in their life and they don't want to deal with it. And then it goes even a step further, how that society says, you know what? Children are such a burden that if you are going to have difficulty with those children, then abort them before they're born. Murder them because they're a nuisance. They're an inconvenience in your life. You don't really want them. It's going to be difficult. It's a shame and a disgrace. And society tells us that marriage is a hardship, a burden. The Lord says in Proverbs chapter 18 that a man who gets a wife gets a blessing from the Lord. You know, marriage is a blessing. When you have a husband and a wife who are committed to God and doing His will, it's a blessing. Having children is a blessing from God, not a curse. So we can enjoy our family. We can have great happiness and peace and contentment in enriching relationships with them. That's a blessing from God and comes from serving God. Another blessing that we have is this earth, the world. In Psalm chapter 19, the psalmist looks at the universe and he stands in awe of the creation of God. In Psalm 19, verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God and the earth or the firmament shows his handiwork. Day and day, day utter speech and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone throughout all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of heaven and its circuit to the other end. And there's nothing hidden from its heat. He looks at this universe and he says it screams the existence of God, his power, his majesty. You know, people in our society look at the universe and they see something to be worshipped. They sometimes talk about the, the animals and the trees and how man needs to um, be sensitive toward them because essentially they're equal to man. The Bible says man's to have dominion over these things. Now, man's not to abuse them, but man is to use them. They are here to serve us. But some people want to worship the earth, essentially. They think the earth itself is sacred. The animals are sacred. That's paganism. And we need to recognize that God gives us the earth to enjoy it's a great blessing to be able to go out into nature and observe the beauty and the handiwork of God and the amazing creatures that he has made and the stars in the sky at night. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. But it's not something that we are to worship. It's to be enjoyed. And it's to fill us with awe and wonder at the mighty hand of God. Now, something else in Ecclesiastes chapter 5. You know, there are people who have the idea that Christianity and poverty go hand in hand, almost like Christianity requires you to be poor. But that's not true. Remember the Ecclesiastes writer that he observes the world. He observes the things of the world, the, the fun, the, the material things, the power, the pleasures of life. And he says they're all vanity. But he comes back in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 18 and says this, Here's what I have seen. It is good and fitting for one to eat and drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor in which that he toils under the sun all the days of his life, which God gives him, for it is his heritage. As for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth and given him power to eat of it, to receive his heritage and rejoice in his labor, this is the gift of God. 
the thing the Bible teaches is we are not to make riches our aim, our pursuit in life. We're not to allow our possessions to possess us, so to speak. But we're to have them in their proper place, to use them to serve our fellow man, to serve God. But also, he says here, to enjoy them. It's okay to have things and to enjoy them. Just don't let them dominate your life. Don't let them be your goal in life. But rather, what we need to do is make sure that our priorities are straight. As he concludes that letter, the Ecclesiastes letter, he says this, Let us hear the conclusion of the matter. This is Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. The reason we were created and how we are designed is a part of our nature is to have fellowship with God. And to be truly fulfilled and truly content, we must fear God and keep His commandments. Keeping in mind, He's going to judge us. He's going to bring all of us to account one day. So we need to fear God and keep His commandments. That is, having our priorities straight. That's what the wise man says in Ecclesiastes. And so... Our focus needs to be on going to heaven because next to it, nothing else matters. If we can help you to get your priorities straight, if you examine your life as you're watching this, you're reflecting on yourself and you recognize, you know what? My priorities are not straight. I've been pursuing the wrong things. There are things I need to change and fix in my life. Then won't you be determined to do that? And we invite you, we encourage you, reach out to us if we can help you to put your focus on heaven, to put your focus on serving God. This Bible study program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ, located in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to call 828-465-3009 to talk to one of our members and ask your Bible question. Some of the questions we receive will be used on a future episode of the program to help others who may have the same question. Again, that number is 828-465-3009. What is faith? The book of Hebrews chapter 11 answers that question for us. So we read Hebrews 11 verses 1 through 3. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony by faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Well, we begin to break this down here where it says faith is the substance of things hoped for. The original word means, according to the expositor's Greek Testament, literally foundation, that which stands under, hence the ground on which one builds hope. So it's saying faith is a foundation of something. It goes on to comment this way. That is, the expositor's Greek Testament makes these comments. It says it's a definition of what faith does, not necessarily what faith is. So we might put it, it's a description of faith. It says substantially the word means that faith gives to things future which as yet are only hoped for, all the reality of actual present existence and irresistibly convinces us of the reality of things unseen and brings us into their presence. Things future and things unseen must become certainties to the mind of a balanced life if a balanced life is to be lived. So this substance here, that it's talking about, says it gives you the ability to see the unseen. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. In 2 Corinthians 9, verse 4, this word is translated as confident. In 2 Corinthians eleven seventeen, is translated as confidence. And the same thing is true back in Hebrews 3, verse 14, the same word is translated as confidence. So we might say, now, faith is the confidence of things hoped for. 
But then what about this other word, the evidence of things not seen? And that really is an unfortunate translation of it here in the New King James Version. Um, other translations and the word that's in the original here is translated in other places as convict or conviction. So John 16 verse 8 talks about being convicted of sin. That's the same word translated as evidence here. Or Titus 1 verse 9, convicted of truth or convinced of truth in 2 Timothy 4 verse 2. So we put these two together. And what we have is that faith is the conviction that gives rise to confidence. Faith is the substance, the confidence of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Because faith is not evidence of anything. What I believe is only evidence of what I believe. What you believe is only evidence of what you believe. Just because you believe it doesn't make it so. Just because I believe something doesn't make it a reality. You know, there are people who have this idea of blind faith and um, a lot of skeptics and unbelievers accuse people who believe in God, believe in Jesus of having a blind faith. Well, it's not blind faith that people have that believe in God. There's evidence behind that. Now, so, and it's, it's not my belief in it that's evidence of the existence of God. I believe in it because the evidence proves there is a God. So the universe, the orderliness of the universe, the human body, all kinds of things, the word of God itself proves that there is a God. And, and we won't dive into all of that. But here's one thing I want you to think about. In Romans 10, 17, it says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. The Word of God gives us evidence to believe in God, to know God, to believe in Jesus as the Son of God, the Savior of the world. See, God doesn't expect us to believe just to believe because somebody comes and tells us to believe. He gives the evidence of that, if you will. He gives not only the eyewitness testimony of it, but there is abundant other evidence that shows us that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. So faith is a conviction that gives rise to confidence. Now, it says here that the elders obtained good testimony. When you go through Hebrews chapter 11, it talks about different people acting by faith. By faith, verse 4, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Verse 7, by faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his house. By faith, verse 8, Abraham obeyed God when he was called to go out, and he went out. It's talking about action people take. So the word of God came to them and told them to do something. They did it. That's what faith is. That's faith in action. That's faith in life. That's real biblical faith. A belief in and of itself isn't necessarily biblical faith because we have to act on that belief. We have to follow through with it. We have to submit to God's will and God's command. So the elders obtained a good testimony as he's writing about in this chapter because their lives are given as examples and they're recorded by the Holy Spirit. And it talks here about the creation in verse 3. By faith, we understand the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made with things which are visible. None of us were there at creation. But we believe in creation because the evidence that's given, we have the evidence of the world around us, the evidence of the universe, the evidence of the physical earth itself, this globe on which we live. The evidence of God's word really tells us that. Remember, in the beginning was the word or in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and God said, let there be light. 
Remember in Psalm 33, Psalm 33, here's the evidence that gives us conviction that leads to our competence. In Psalm 33, verse 6, by the word of God or by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. In Psalm 33, verse 9, For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. See, the Word of God framed the worlds, as Hebrews eleven three 3 says, and made them so that the things which are seen are made of things which are not visible. We, we talked earlier about the idea that the faith makes something that we don't see a reality or something we don't yet possess as a reality. We didn't see the creation, but to us, it is a reality. Not because it's a fanciful wish, but because the evidence points to that and we reach a logical conclusion that this universe and all things in it were brought about and created by a divine intelligence an all-powerful God who made the heavens and the earth. So faith is a conviction that gives rise to confidence based on evidence given by God. This Bible study program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ located in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to call 828 465 3009 to talk to one of our members and ask your Bible question. Some of the questions we receive will be used on a future episode of the program to help others who may have the same question. Again, that number is 828-465-3009. In this segment, we continue our study in the book of 1 Peter. We are in 1 Peter chapter 3, where he continues to discuss specific applications of how Christians are to behave in this world and in different relationships that they sustain in this world. Overall, remember in chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, he said that as strangers and pilgrims, we are to abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul, and conduct ourselves in a way that would lead others to glorify God. He then went on in chapter 2 to talk about our relationship to the government and our relationship to masters, or in modern day terms, it would be employee-employer type of relationships. Now, in chapter 3, at the beginning, he talks about the husband-wife relationship. He begins by addressing the wife, and then he talks about the husband. And then when you get in verses 8 to 12, he addresses the relationship between Christians, between brethren, and how they should conduct themselves. And so we want to dig into this and begin to look at the admonitions that he has for us and keeping in mind that what the Apostle Peter said is, first of all, inspired. But second of all, because it is inspired, it is in our best interest and it's the right way for us to conduct ourselves in this life. Whatever advice the Bible gives in relation to husbands, wives, parents, children, employees, employers, any, any relationship at all, what the Bible says is the best way because it's God's way. And it doesn't matter how we may feel about it, how others may feel, how people in academics may feel, or psychologists, or so-called experts in this world, the fact of the matter is, because what we have in the Bible comes from God, it is the best and the right way. So with that in mind, let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 3, and let's read verses 1 through 6 to start with as Peter addresses wives. It says, Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives." when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. 
For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. First of all, he says there in verse 1 something that is extremely controversial in our modern society. He says that the wives are to be submissive to their husbands. Now, let's understand, he says to your own husbands, not to other husbands, not to other men and other household who have their own wives, who have their own family, but to be submissive to your own husbands. And I think it's worth noting here that he's directing this to the wife, not to the husband. In other words, the wife is to make the decision and the wife is to apply this in her life. It's not the husband's job to make sure his wife is submissive. It is the wife's job to make sure that she is obedient to this command that God is giving through Peter to the women who are married. So it's directed to the wives, and the wives are to make their own decision about their attitude and their disposition and their determination to do what God would have them to do. Now notice he says here that the purpose of the submission is in order to lead a husband to salvation. It says, even if some did not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. So this scenario being put before us is that you have a woman who is a Christian married to someone who is not a Christian. And that man who is not a Christian doesn't want to hear the teaching, doesn't want to study the scriptures or things like that. But his wife's conduct helps to bring him around to where he would change his mind, his heart would open up, he would hear the gospel, he would believe, he would obey and do the will of God. Because some people need to be convinced that the person who's trying to persuade them to change their ways, that that person is genuine and sincere and dedicated, and that it is having an impact in their life that what they believe and what they practice makes them a better person, and it is a benefit to them. And so he's telling the wives here, be submissive to your husbands, that even if they don't want to study the word, that your conduct's going to have an influence and an impact on them. And let's understand that as we think about this, that the conduct that he gives here is this submissive conduct. In verse 2, they observe your chaste conduct accompanied with fear. Um, one of the things we understand is this submission here is the way to win, not a nagging woman, not a woman who's criticizing and harping on her husband all the time, but the behavior and the attitude of the wife is going to impact him and show him that she's not doing these things in rebellion toward her husband. She's not doing them in rebellion toward family heritage, that he may have a long family heritage of a particular religion. Of course, at this time, the idea would be some type of paganism or maybe even Judaism, that she's not simply kicking up against that, but she truly believes in Jesus as the Christ and truly believes his word and how to live their, her life before God. Now, the New American Commentary makes this note that I think is worthy of our attention. It says that this submission is not to please her husband. She's not doing it so her husband will be happy. She's not doing it to show how godly she is. She's not doing it to avoid conflict and disputes in the relationship with her husband. And she's not doing it to manipulate her husband to simply get what she wants out of this relationship, but she's doing it because of her relationship to God. Again, in verse two, this conduct that's accompanied by fear. As we've studied before, the Bible does not teach us to fear men. In fact, it says don't fear men, but to fear God. And so when he mentions fear here, he's talking about in the context of fearing God. If you go back up to chapter two, 
in verse 17, in this flow of the discussion, he says, honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God. So here, when he says your conduct is to be accompanied by fear, he's talking about the fear of God. As the New American Commentary points out, she's not doing it simply to please her husband, though he may be pleased. She's not doing it to show off her godly character, though it does show a godly character. And all these other things, she's not doing it for those things. Those are the result of this behavior. Her motivation is to respect and honor God first and foremost. Now, this conduct here in verse 2, your chaste conduct, that's accompanied or tied to the submission that he has just talked about. So this wife is not a flirt, and she's not someone who dresses in a way that draws the attention of men. In other words, her body is not going to be put on display so that it draws the admiration, the attention, the desires of other men. She's not going to do that on purpose. So she's going to have reverence for God and a respect for her husband as well as she has chaste conduct. And so verses three and four says, don't let your adornment be merely outward. So don't focus on the outer part of yourself, the the way that you dress, the way that you fix your hair, the things that you uh, put on, the wearing of gold and things like that, but rather let it be the hidden person of the heart, that, that which is inside of you. You focus on the inner beauty, not so much the outer beauty. And so when we think about this, a husband or a wife's greatest tool to have influence with her husband is her behavior, her submissive conduct, her chaste conduct, her focus on the inward person, not the outward. That's what's going to help out. Not someone who is contentious and angry and bitter, but someone who is tranquil and yielding and kind to her husband. Now, let's understand that this is not forbidding women to give attention to how they look, to their hair, to makeup, to the way that they dress. Yes, that's all perfectly okay and acceptable in and of itself. But don't use the outward as a means of drawing attention or gaining respect because the woman is supposed to focus on her godly character, the inner woman, that which is incorruptible. As Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the, the outward man is perishing, but the inward man is being renewed day by day. So she's focusing on the inside that grows stronger over time. And that beauty increases as the years go by. The outward part is going to fade. The outward part is going to diminish over time, whether that be clothes that wear out over time, just the practical side of that, or the body. Everyone's body grows old and it changes over time. And there's no preventing that, no matter how difficult they try. And I think we've all seen it before, particularly maybe celebrities and how that they try to fight that aging process, and they have all kinds of procedures. And there comes a point where it looks, shall we say, grotesque. It looks terrible. And everyone sees that what they're trying is not only not working, but it's counterproductive. So think about what he's saying here, that the wife is to focus on the inner beauty, not the outer beauty because that inner beauty is going to last. If the outward beauty is how someone gains respect and attention, then as the years go by, that respect and attention is going to diminish because the outward is going to fade. It's going to grow old. It's it's going to wear down, if you will. But if they're focused on the inward because it grows stronger over time, the respect, the attention, the admiration is only going to grow as time goes by. And so he says, have this kind of spirit, that inner spirit, the hidden person of the heart, the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, 
Now notice again, verse 4, which is very precious in the sight of God. That's worth noting. It is very precious in the sight of God. God places a high value on this. And again, before we go too far, we understand that in our society today, people become outraged. Even religious people who say they believe in the Bible become outraged at the idea of a woman being told, you need to be submissive to your husband. You need to focus on the inward beauty, not the outward beauty. You need to have chaste conduct. You need to be modest. You need to be dressed modest. You need to cover up your body. Save that for your husband and for him alone. Don't put it on display for other men. There are some people who become very angry and upset about it. But notice that God puts a very high price on this, a very high value on this, very precious in the sight of God. Then verses 5 and 6, he gives an example of the holy women of old, particularly the example of Sarah. And again, he says this, In former times, the holy women of old conducted, also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. So holy women were submissive to their own husbands. Now notice verse 6. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, did you notice submission and obedience are tied together? That's what he's talking about. In Titus chapter 2, it talks about the wives obeying their husbands, being obedient to them. Again, that's anathema in our modern society, but that's what the Bible teaches about the husband-wife relationship. And so Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Now, the only account we have of Sarah calling Abraham Lord is in Genesis chapter 18, when the angels and the Lord came to Abraham to tell him that Sodom was going to be destroyed. And when Sarah is in the tent and God is speaking to Abraham outside, and God tells Abraham that Sarah is going to bear a child, that she was in the tent and thinking to herself. And in that thinking, she said, my Lord, referring to Abraham. So here's the point. It was so ingrained in her that even in her thoughts, when she thought about her husband, she said, my Lord. Now, this is not saying that women today need to call their husbands Lord. Nothing like that. It's just saying that respect for the husband, that's going to be beneficial to the relationship. That will be contribute to the health of that relationship between the husband and the wife. And notice it says particularly that the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves with this gentle and quiet spirit, being submissive to their own husbands. So if they trust God, they'll be submissive to their husbands. If they don't trust God, they won't be submissive. Or to put it another way, if they're not submissive, it shows they don't trust God. God. And so women who trust God will be submissive to their husbands. But before we leave this subject, let's understand being submissive to the husband is bounded by the teaching of the word of God. She cannot be submissive to him in sin. She cannot go along with or condone uh, sin and participate in sin. So there are boundaries on this. But let's get to the husband. And notice what he says about the husband in verse 7. It says, Husbands likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and being heirs together the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. So you think about the husband's duty to the wife here. He is told to dwell with her with understanding. Now, there's two senses that this is generally understood, that he's to dwell with her with understanding about his responsibility to God. He understands these things that he's talking about here are in relation to God first and foremost, and he must honor God above all things and respect him. But then it's also the idea of understanding his wife, understanding her unique nature. A man doesn't have to understand every woman. He doesn't have to understand other men's wives. He needs to understand his wife, what it is that she has as hopes and dreams 
what she is concerned about in life, her anxieties in life, and how it is that she is cherished and nourished, as Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 5. So he has to dwell with her with understanding and honor the wife, it says, as to the weaker vessel. Now, some people have looked at that and said, well, that's talking about a woman being physically weaker than a man. And so a, a husband's supposed to be physically gentle with her. Well, it very well may be true that women are generally physically weaker than men. But that's really not what he's talking about here. He says, as to the weaker vessel. And what he's talking about here. The husband is to look at his wife and to think of her as something that is precious and valuable and delicate. So he treats her with tenderness, kindness, gentleness. That's the idea here, as the weaker vessel, not as a lesser vessel, not as an inferior vessel, but as something that is very valuable and can be fragile if you will. Not that she has fragile makeup, but that he's to cherish her to and make sure that he's not doing something that's hurting her, that's going to scar her. So men have all kinds of things in life that they cherish, that they possess. And, you know, sometimes they'll put it in a case and maybe even put it in a case and lock it up and maybe put it on display and put a light on it. That's the kind of thing he's talking about here, that she is very valuable, very precious. He wants to do everything to protect her and to give honor to her. Now, think about this. A man does not fulfill this when he's lusting after other women, whether that's lusting after women at work or in the neighborhood, at the local store, if he's looking at movies and television where he's lusting at the women on the screen or looking at pornography, when he's doing that, he's not honoring his wife. He's dishonoring his wife and dishonoring that relationship. He's not counting her as one who is precious and valuable and cherished in his heart, but he is disgracing her when he does these things. And so how he's going to fulfill this is spending time with his wife, letting her know and conveying to her, you have my desires, you have my attention. So he'll spend time with her. He'll talk with her about things she wants to talk about. He'll listen to her and what she has to say and her concerns and her joys and all of those things. He won't simply tune her out and watch TV, watch sports, or go and give attention to his hobbies and just leave his wife to herself. No, he's going to be attentive to her. He will be patient with her. He will work on his own character, and he'll spend time in prayer and reading God's Word and really putting forth effort to be a better man, to be more loving and kind and understanding. He'll show her in his life and his changes over time that he really is thinking about her best interest. And so he will sacrifice for her and he will serve her in his life. You know, he's going to study and pray and worship with her. He won't leave her to go to church by herself or take the children on her own but he's going to be actively involved in leading that. He'll help to take care of the children and do things around the house to keep the house going, maybe cook meals and clean things around the house. And he'll take her to do what she wants to do, not simply insist on doing what he wants to do all the time. And notice what he says here in verse 7. Again, at the very end, he says, And as being heirs together the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Now, heirs together the grace of life is pointing to the fact that the husband and wife should be helping each other to get to heaven. In fact, that is the number one purpose in marriage. 
I know there's a lot of people that think the, the number one purpose in marriage is procreation. It's not. The number one purpose in marriage is for the husband and the wife to help each other serve God in this life and get to heaven in the next. So Peter's reminding the husbands here, here's what it's all about, that you would be heirs together of the grace of life. And you treat her with honor. You dwell with her with understanding so that your prayers may not be hindered. In other words, if you're mistreating your wife, God doesn't hear your prayers. You have broken fellowship with him because you have mistreated the blessing he's given to you with your wife. So husbands need to give attention to their attitude, their disposition, their behavior toward their wife, and make sure that they're honoring their wives, cherishing and nourishing their wives. Now we'll come back in the next segment and notice the admonitions Peter gives about how brethren are to treat one another. The members of the Newton Church of Christ thank you for watching this Bible study program. Our aim is to assist you to gain a better understanding of God's Word and encourage you to submit to the Lord. We invite you to send us an email with your Bible question or a comment about this episode. Please include your first name and the city or town where you live. We will respond with the Bible answer. You can send your email to contact at wordandsword.com. That's contact at wordandsword.com. Let's now examine what Peter says about how brethren are to treat each other. In 1 Peter 3, we want to read verses 8 through 12. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers, be tenderhearted, be courteous not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. First of all, he talks about these brethren. Finally, all of you be of one mind. You know, the Bible admonishes those who are disciples of Christ to be united together. And it's sad that many these days think that division among disciples and those who would follow the Lord is good. They think it's good that everybody can pick their own flavor of religion and they can all practice different things and teach different things and everything's okay. It's the Bible doesn't teach unity in doctrinal diversity. It doesn't teach, well, you believe your way and I believe my way and let's just accept each other and everything will be all right. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, the Apostle Paul makes this plea. Now, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So you speak the same thing, you teach the same thing, you have the same mind, the same beliefs, same convictions, and same judgment, same application. So he's not saying that there won't be differences among Christians. There will be. But understanding that you can't both believe Jesus is the divine Son of God, and he's not. You can't both believe he was resurrected from the dead, and he's not. You can't both believe that Fornication is acceptable, and it's not. That adultery is okay, and it's not. You see, there are some things that there's no room within the Word of God for you to pick and choose what you want to believe on it. And that comes down to worship and the church organization. 
these things are laid out, what the church is involved in in its work. It's all laid out in the New Testament. And so again, back in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, he says, all of you be of one mind to have that unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, as Paul writes about in Ephesians 4. That's what he's looking forward to. That's what he wants us to adhere to. So he says that having this one mind, being having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tenderhearted, be courteous. So we need to be tenderhearted and compassionate toward each other because it is commanded, first of all. But second, anybody who is a Christian is saved by grace. Everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so one Christian is not better than another. Doesn't matter what your background is. One sin separates us from God as much as a thousand sins. And a little white lie separates us as much as murder. So let's understand, as he's saying here, we are to have compassion for one another, tenderhearted, courteous, because nobody's better than anybody else. We all stand condemned before God. We all stand in need of God's grace. Now, another thing I want us to think about is next to our spouse and maybe our children, the ones in this world who are going to help us to get to heaven is other people who are committed to Jesus Christ. And so we want to work to maintain those relationships, to have good and healthy relationships with others who serve the Lord. It's unfortunate, but some Christians believe it's their job to search out and to criticize the slightest perceived misstep of someone else who's striving to serve the Lord. You know, Jesus talked about this over in Matthew chapter 7. He talked about those who would be hypercritical and hypocritical. In Matthew 7, in verse 1, where he says, Judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but not consider the plank that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye? Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Now, let's understand very plainly here. Jesus is not saying you can't judge other people. Because he very clearly spells out here, when you take care of whatever issue you have, you help someone else fix theirs. And the only way you can do that is by judging whether or not they're living right. Taking the standard of God's word and applying that so that you can benefit them and help them. What he's condemning here is the hypercritical judgment, you know, to get the speck out of somebody else's eye. And the hypocritical judgment, you've got a plank in your own. Take care of that first and then help someone else. So don't be hypercritical and don't be hypocritical. A spirit of criticism comes along when we think we're better than other people. And maybe we have a jealousy. Maybe we have envy. Maybe we have that inferiority complex. And so we turn around and criticize them in mind or in words. We criticize them to try to bring them down and make ourselves feel better. And the Lord tells us you cannot have that. He warns in Galatians chapter 5 about having a spirit of criticism and brethren attacking one another. He says in Galatians 5, verse 15, But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. So there is a great danger that those who would serve God turn against each other. The devil wants them to turn against each other, to be hypercritical, to be hypocritical, to bite and devour, so that it destroys souls and it destroys 
that work that could be done among those brethren to help advance the cause of Christ. So he says, you need to be tenderhearted. You need to be courteous. Verse 9, back in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling. So don't be ugly when other people are ugly to you. Don't be mean when they're mean to you. You need to rather, as he says here, return a blessing to bless those who curse you. It's essential to inheriting a blessing. Notice again what he says. Don't return evil for evil, reviling for reviling. On the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. So if we return evil for evil, we won't inherit a blessing. But we want to inherit that, so we're not going to respond in kind. But we'll respond with generosity and blessing others and helping others. And next he quotes from Psalm 34 in verses 10 through 12. Now, this is a Psalm of David that he wrote in a time of danger and fear, as he did many of his Psalms. And we ask the question, you know, where he says he would love life and see good days. What does it mean to love life and see good days? Well, to love life, in some translations, it has he who would desire life or choose life. And in the context, inheriting the blessing and all the things that Peter's been talking about in this letter, he's looking to eternal life. He's not talking about this life, but who would want eternal life? Who would choose that? Who would desire that? Who's going to see good days, if you will? Not just in this life, but really in the next. Well, then what does he need to do? Let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lip from speaking deceit. So stay away from sin. Stay away from these bad attitudes, these words that are harmful and hurtful toward others. Control your tongue. Have a godly orientation, a godly bearing in your life and seek peace. Pursue it. The devil tries to drive wedges in among the children of God. And he says we have to resist that and have peace among those who are serving God, actively doing God's will, no matter what other people may do. That's how we're going to love life, if you will, and see good days. Notice that he says here at the end, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. If we sin, we're not going to enjoy life and see good days. The Lord hears the prayers of his children, and he doesn't hear the prayers of those who are not his children. There are a lot of people that they will turn to God and appeal to him in a time of need, but they have no relationship with God. They don't have fellowship with him, and he doesn't hear those prayers. He's he's not looking at that because they're living a life of sin and of wickedness. Now, if somebody genuinely wants to serve God, he opens the door of opportunity for them to hear the gospel. And that may very well be the opportunity that's presented to you right now. God opens that door of opportunity, just like he did with Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. That door of opportunity was open to him. He heard the gospel and he believed and was baptized. He was saved. But if somebody's living in sin and they're not right with God in their life and they appeal to him, it says that his face is against those who do evil. But those who turn to him, those who submit to him, those who are righteous because they have been blessed with the forgiveness of their sins and they're living it by God's will, it says his ears are open to their prayers. And so we want to be a people that apply the word of God in our life so that he does hear our prayers and he is with us. And we can enjoy that promise that he will never leave us nor forsake us. This wraps up our study in 1 Peter 3 for this segment. We hope you'll join us again in a future episode when we continue on in this series of studies. But take to heart 
what he's writing here about the relationships that we have and how it is that these relationships in all aspects, we need to make sure that we are honoring God above all. Thank you for watching The Word and Sword brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ located in Newton, North Carolina. Our aim is to assist you to gain a better understanding of God's Word and encourage you to follow the Lord in all things. Do you want to study more about God's Word, His saving plan for man, and the church Jesus established? Please let us know and we are happy to provide you with materials for additional study. Call and request a correspondence course that will be sent via U.S. mail or to be added to the church's quarterly mail out of the bulletin or a copy of the outlines of our lessons. Call us at 828-465-3009. Again, that number is 828-465-3009. If there is no answer, please leave a message and we will fulfill your request or return your call as soon as possible. You may also go to wordandsword.com for many more Bible study materials, including past episodes of this TV program, or scroll down on the homepage to take a quiz and test your Bible knowledge. That's again, wordandsword.com. Visit our Facebook page, facebook.com slash wordandsword. Leave a comment about the program or ask a Bible question. Again, that's facebook.com slash word and sword. If you live within driving distance, we invite you to join us in one of our services and meet us in person. We meet on Sundays at 10 a.m. for Bible class and 11 a.m. for worship. On Wednesday, we have Bible classes at 7 p.m. Our classes are for those of all ages. We are located at 656 St. James Church Road, Newton, North Carolina. That is 656 St. James Church Road, Newton, North Carolina. Our contact information once more. The phone, 828-465-3009. Email, contact at wordandsword.com. Our Facebook page is facebook.com slash word and sword. Our website is wordandsword.com. And our address is 656 St. James Church Road, Newton, North Carolina. Nor man's empty praise 